Okay. Right, we're being recorded, but I will put myself as the pinned video. So therefore, everybody sees me mainly. Uh, so we don't have to worry about uh, everybody being viewed the whole time. Okay, welcome back to my Shia. It's been, uh, it's been a month. Thank you. And Joe Yohe has been waiting very patiently to host the Shia because as soon as we finished the last Shia, he paid to host the next Shia, which was in honor of his father, Nisim ben Yaakov's York site, which was July 26th. And his grandfather's York site, Rabbi Yeshayahu ben Rabbi Yaakov Yisrael Halevi, on July the 31st. But since we didn't have any Shias, Shiorim around that time, uh, this is the first one available, but it doesn't matter because one can put anything at any time, Elu uh, Nishmas, somebody. So, those of you who remember my previous Elul Shiorim, we always used to start with the blowing of the shofar. We blow the shofar in Elul, as you know, and therefore some people don't hear it. It's not a mitzvah to hear it, right? But it's nice to hear it, to get in the mood. I know Chabad, I went to a chasna once, and they blew it under the chuba. So I know they're very particular about blowing it. So let me just blow uh, the note now. Okay. So that means we know that Rosh Hashanah is coming. I must say I was very pleased gave myself a little allegorical pat on the back. I announced on Shul on Shabbos, for those who were here, that I saw a suggestion that a 45-minute in-person shear should translate as a half an hour Zoom shear, because at Zoom, you're in your own house, you're in your own place, there's all distractions. So I said, maybe I'll experiment with that idea. But somebody came up to me afterwards and said, Rabbi, no, 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 no. We like your shiurim. We like the length of them. So please keep it at 45 minutes. I'm like, oh, that's nice. Most rabbis are told, shut up and get on with it. So uh, when I even wanted to give it shorter, I see people getting annoyed now on Zoom. Oh, who was that person? You're all wondering. Uh, so maybe we'll try to do some sort of a hybrid idea. I was going to talk about something, but this afternoon... I wanted to uh, start with something else. Okay, go ahead. And that is the role of women. I think somebody's at the door. And that is the role of women and the way that we look at women and view women in Yiddishkeit. Since we last gave a shear, we have all of the... Ah, hello. That's not bigger. It's a little bigger. It is a little bigger. So since our last oh. shear... Here, let me, uh, I'll let me mute everybody because there's a little bit of noise. Uh, hold on a minute. Okay, let's mute everybody. And there we go. Right, so everybody is muted. You can all hear me? Yes, I'm unmuted. Good. Okay, so since we last had a share, the program, I think it was called My Unorthodox Life, uh, came out with the role of a lady called... Uh, heart, I think her name was, um, about how she left the Orthodox Jewish world, and that caused obviously a big furore. And then again today we saw with the Taliban taking again control uh, in uh, Afghanistan, of course everyone's worried about what they're going to do to women and so on, especially their record uh, when they were last in power 20 years ago was not great uh, on women's rights and women's uh, liberties and so on. So I thought when I was going through the parasha today, something struck me. So I wanted to uh, just talk about that for a few minutes. I've given a shear when the sisterhood had their opening night shear a couple of years ago. I don't know if you were there, Marsha. And I gave a shear all about the Jewish view on women and how, if you look, when man was created, man was created from earth, right? He took earth from the ground and created man, whereas women don't have earth in them. He created them from bone. And the Gemara talks about that's why women have nice voices because, you know, their bones, it's, it's, uh, anyway. So I said, that's why women are not, are more spiritual. They're more higher because they're not weighed down by the, by the earthly pursuits. So I've given many shiorim about that and, and, and their ideas of how we see women. But something from this week's Pasha struck me this morning. And that is, we have an interesting halacha at the beginning of the Pasha of what's known as the Asha Sifas Toa, the woman literally of beautiful appearance. So when men went out to war and their testosterone is flowing and they're, you know, 
uh, all uh, going crazy and so on. And these old and day warfare, they would send out these women all, all, all beautifully attired in order to entice the men. And Allah was, even if this woman was married, a married non-Jewish woman still is, is, is forbidden. Uh, well, according to most opinions anyway, but a, non, a, a non-Jewish married, I mean, not that I'm saying that non-Jewish women are permitted anyway, but I'm talking about the sin of having an affair with uh, committing adultery with a married woman applies to non-Jews as well, um, according to the Rambam and so on. But in this case, uh, the Torah made an exception uh, due to the uh, way people were in war and the difficulties and so on. So you're allowed to to take her and have a relationship with her. You have to follow this process afterwards. Then it says, well, yeah, if you didn't want her after all that, you decided you didn't want her. You have to be very, very careful. Let's read it inside. What does it say? It says, <laughs> you got to be, but she lacked the right? Okay, she wants to go, so you send her away. But you can't sell her as a slave. And it says, <laughs> you must not enslave her, and you must be careful with her. Nisa. <laughs> And I was thinking, you know, you can judge a culture and a society by the way it treats its lowest class citizens, right? The way people treat the lowest of society, the people that we perceive as being low in society. I'm not saying that we should have higher and lower classes, but let's be honest. That's what happens in society. We have people who are what you call the gentry and the upper class. So you can tell a lot about people how they treat uh, the lower class and the people may be less well off, less fortunate. And here we have this woman. This is a non-Jewish woman after all, right? Non-Jewish. And she was brought out in war to entice people, right? To help with the victory from the opposite side. So this is not somebody that you would have necessarily have thought that you would have had to go out of your way to be nice to, right? And I think it's fair to say that certainly in those years, most cultures probably would have completely abused and mistreated these people a slave, I've captured you in war, you're my spoils, you're my beauty, all this sort of stuff, right? That's how it probably was in those days. But the Torah is warning us just the opposite. You have to, you can't sell her as a slave, you can't enslave her. And I thought that's an uh, interesting one to point out about how we view uh, women, that they're not, as some cultures might think, uh, fair game or whatever it is that they call and, and people are worried about certainly in Afghanistan and stuff women have just as much rights as men and so on and so forth and they should be treated with just as much respect and so on and then again if you go further into the Pasha it talks about the laws of rape and the laws of seduction right I can understand rape is something anybody would say is is is, is forbidden but even seduction is something that is uh, not right because you are basically coercing somebody, right? Against uh, perhaps their will. And therefore, that's also forbidden. And there are penalties and so on. And I just wanted to point that out in the way, in the era that people perceive how certainly Jewish women are, are treated and so on. But we can see from a couple of these uh, paragraphs in this week's parasha how much respect that we have to have and how what high esteem we have to uh, hold women, and they're certainly not uh, like people in the wider world might perceive second-class citizens or in any way, shape, or form uh, lower or, or whatever. And therefore, I wanted to point that out before we started, especially with what's uh, going on in the news uh, at the moment. Okay, so those of you who have been with my share over the last few months will know that we developed a theme. Sometimes, every year we seem to develop a theme, and these themes come about on their own. You know, we go through a few things, we see things, and we use those goggles and those uh, analytical skills to analyze a lot of sources. So this year, starting with the election in November, and then all the craziness that ensued afterwards, and uh, of course, unfortunately, with the wars in Gaza and so on, we went through a lot of ideas about free will, right? Who had free will? What sort of free will do we have? And we went through all the sources about Hashem running the world, coming to Rosh Hashanah, where, of course, one of the most important things is we have to acknowledge Hashem is the king. We have to acknowledge his power and his might and how everything happens by his say-so. And we said that it seems that free will was getting more and more limited the more and more shiurim that we gave. And we clearly said that on a public level, on a country level, everything is in the hands of Hashem. Every elected official, we quoted the Pasuk in 
Mishne Lev Melachim Biyad Elikim, the hearts of the kings are in the uh, hands of God. He's the one who manipulates everything. Geopolitical, um, uh, what did they call it? Ge geopolitics is all in the hands of Hashem, which is why I quoted from my Rebbe. He said that when people are standing for election, they make all sorts of promises, but very few of them keep them. And why is that? Because when they're standing for election, they're their own boss. So they say what they want. When they get into power, Hashem is running the world. So Hashem says, well, I'm very sorry. You made all these promises. Very nice. Boo-hoo to you. Now we're going to run according to my way. Thank you very much. And that's why a lot of people don't end up keeping their promises. And that's how we went through. And we said that free will is becoming more and more limited to things like, you know what? I fancy now going and having a hamburger. Or I fancy talking during davening. That's a decision I can make myself. But anything that has serious consequences, and serious effects, that is uh, certainly for a lot of people and so on, that seems to be clearly defined by Hashem's plan. Um, we quoted from the Chassam Sofer that he says, one should not daven for the end of wars, because wars are all part of Hashem's plan. And we quoted an example of the First World War, which is what led to the destruction of the Ottoman Empire. Right? They, 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 they aligned for no reason at all with Germany, they were not even involved or whatever. And then, of course, when it crashed, then Britain got the uh, got the mandate, and because they needed the Balfour Declaration, what was the name of the guy? They needed his uh, expertise, and they made a deal with him, and therefore they signed the Balfour Declaration. All of this happened because of the war. Again, some terrible atrocities and, and craziness, and it's horrible what has happened. So I'm not speaking in, in specific terms, but just in a general idea how Hashem moves. Why, what, who, we don't understand. But we seem to think when we left off my Shia uh, before Tishabov, we seem to be quite conclusive that there is definitely free will. Everybody has free will. Nobody is born evil. Nobody is born uh, wicked, destined to be wicked, wicked. And people have the opportunity to be like the Gemara says. You can choose whether you be a tzaddik, righteous, or non-righteous. That's what we assumed, or I assumed, or probably you assumed, when we last had my shear. And I must apologize, you're probably coming to my shear looking for clarity and looking uh, for answers. Well, I'm going to uh, shatter a few things now and not necessarily provide you with any answers. We were in the Daf Yomi, the end of Yuma, uh, just about three days. I saw all this like three days after I gave my last shear. I thought, ah! Got to wait now till I get my next year. And I, I told you, remind me, I must say this. I can't forget this. So <laughs> I'm glad I remembered uh, all this time to say it. So I came across a Gemara. came across. We're learning this Gemara. And this Gemara has uh, some fascinating ramifications. The Gemara is talking about the prohibition of eating on Yom Kippur. And the, I suppose you could say, leniencies for those who are ill, pregnant, and, 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 and women who have just given birth. People who need to eat obviously have to eat. They have to eat. That's what the Gemara is talking about. So the Gemara then says, but pregnant women, uh, before they give birth, should uh, try and fast as much as possible. Then the Gemara gives a story. And the Gemara went through that you have to be very careful because if a woman starts smelling a smell, she has to be able to partake of that food because it's very dangerous once they desire something. They have a craving for a particular thing. And uh, as the men will know, sometimes you will probably, if you remember that far back, you were sent out in the middle of the night to get, well, certainly I was, to get certain types of food and drinks. And, oh, I must have this. Right, a bit to go. You know, because if they need that craving, they have to have that food or whatever it is, you have to, uh, you have to do it. So the question is, what happens if a woman smells this beautiful food on Yom Kippur? It's dangerous if she doesn't have it because she has that craving. It could be very dangerous if that craving is not satisfied. So the Gemara then gives now two stories. Ha'hu, he over this pregnant woman, this is uh, Yoma Pebe's 82B. This pregnant woman, the she was smelled this beautiful smell on Yom Kippur. Also the Kameh, the Rebbe, came in front of Rebbe, the famous Rebbe, Rebbe Huda Nasi, who wrote the uh, Mishnah. Amalahu, he said to Zilu Luchushaluhu, go whisper to her, the Yoma de Kippur have that it's Yom Kippur today. And the way they explain this Gemara is that you're whispering to the 
fetus because it's like the fetus who's demanding this food somehow and therefore if you tell the fetus hey it's young kibber today sometimes that can uh, you know quieten them down so they did that look at you this election she was out like, okay yeah she didn't need to eat this food so kari ale rebi called over this person bevetan at sarko bevetan yadatiha i created you in the womb and in the womb you knew me are you going to be a tzaddik no for bin rebi yonasan rebi yonasan read the famous rebi yonasan the famous uh, amora rebi yonasan uh, who we pass in like in many cases he was this woman's child so the gemara seems to say that on face value that this guy in the womb was already very righteous came a great tzaddik now let's see the opposite way Another woman, he opened the Alka also the camera to Rebbe. Another pregnant woman smelled on Yom Kippur, came in front of Rebbe, Rebbe Hanina, different Rabbi, Rebbe Hanina. Amalu, he said to them, Look at Shulah, go and whisper to her, it's Yom Kippur today. Velay ilachshi, and she didn't, it didn't do any good, and obviously she had to eat. Now, the eating itself was okay, so don't misunderstand me. Once she's in that situation, she needs to eat, she has to eat. So the eating on that Yom Kippur, was perfectly permitted no sin no avera nothing whatsoever so don't misunderstand that very important however because the fetus didn't quiet him down when they whispered hey it's yom kippur today kari alea he called over this woman zayru rishoy merechem he spreads around the wicked from the womb nothing when a shaptoi oitzeper and this guy called shaptoi who would uh, keep the food and therefore says rashi the price would go up because there'd be no demand, uh, no supply he would hold all the food and therefore wait till the price is there's no other food and then he would say hello right and that's a very bad thing because people are desperate for food and if you raise the prices the gamar throughout shas uh, says some very bad things on people who uh, who raise the prices unnecessary so uh, he, he was not a very good guy this uh, shab toy huh Oh right, yes. <laughs> well, yes. I hear people talk about Pesach and stuff. Okay. Yes. All right. Well. So, so on face value of this Gemara, on face value, it seems because both of these psukim that they quoted, right? The first pasuk said, "The better nutzalticha in your womb I created you." So they're clearly referring to the um, uh, fetus. And the second pasuk is Zoru Rashoy Merechem. He spreads out the wicked from the womb. So both psukim are the womb. So what both psukim are talking about the fetus, and it seems to be that they are saying that we can see already in the womb who is wicked, evil, bad, and who is righteous, which flies in the face of what we thought we knew that everybody has free will, everybody has free choice. So this Gemara represents a big problem. So of course, a lot of the commentators, of course, address it because it's uh, such a glaring, obvious uh, uh, question. And a lot of the answers based upon the fact that yes, you have free will, but that doesn't mean there's two main thought theories of answers. That doesn't mean we have this famous question in the Rambam, which I'm not going to answer for you, about if God knows everything, how can He give you free will? So what they're saying is, yes, you had free will, but we know you're not going to choose it. <laughs> God knew that these people were not going to choose free will for uh, for good, and this was going to be wicked. And He knew that Rabbi Yochanan was going to choose good stuff and become a righteous man. So of course He had free will. Of course He had free will. But Hashem knows the truth and He knows what's going to happen, and therefore He knew this was what's going to transpire. That's one way of saying it that fits in with what we. We know, and even the second way fits into what we know, and that is, if you think about it logically, of course everybody has free will, but yet people are put into different circumstances. People are born with different uh, cravings, different skills, different uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, different genes, different genetics, right? Some people are born very angry. Some people, by nature, are very angry, aggressive people. So they're going to be more prone to being angry, aggressive type people. They have the ability to control it, of course. Everyone has free will, but they're pushed. They're the way they Hashem made them. They're pushed to do certain things. Some people are born with uh, intense desires for doing averas, right? For doing znos and so on and so forth. They have this, this, these overwhelming temptations, and that's their uh, challenge in life to overcome. 
uh, their things. Like sometimes you see some of these heinous crimes and things people do, and you think, how on earth do people even think about have any of these desires? Because you weren't, you didn't have those desires. God never put those desires in you. So you never had the challenge to overcome those things, but they did. So even though we all have free choice, and we all have the ability to control whatever it is and do whatever we want, become right, become wicked. There are still people who are, this is a word I'm looking for, that they're all, they have the different makeup, the different uh, predestined. predestined way. And the way Hashem sets you up, right? It's different way you're brought up, right? Different uh, surroundings, your environments and everything. Some people are predisposed to do certain things, right? Some people have this innate desire for money and to steal and, 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 and to stuff. So... Even though, of course, you have free will, but yeah, Hashem, that's the whole point of life. If everybody was equal and if everybody was the same, it'd be, uh, life would be easy. God has those angels, but everybody has their own little test. Everybody, well, not so little, but everybody has their own set of circumstances. No two lives are the same. If everybody lived the same life and did the same thing, then Hashem, well, what's the test? What's the difficulty? So everybody has their own. So that's the understanding of this Gemara. Yes. They're saying that these people are predisposed to be good. Doesn't mean he will end up being good because he may choose to throw it all away. He may choose to throw away all the good uh, start in life that uh, his genes and his surroundings and his have been given. But the other person the same. He was predisposed, if you like, with difficulties, right? The desire to hoard and create money. He could have overcome it. But what the Rebbe's were saying, that's what it appears. And the truth is, where's the best example of this in the Torah? In Saman Yaakov. Why? In the womb. We forgot all about this. Well, at least I did when we were giving the Shiorim. The two children were fighting in the womb. What does the Medrash say? When they went past the shul, fighting, there was all this uh, agitation to get out. When they went past the church, well, a place of Abode Zorah, they would also be desperate to get out. Rivka was so upset, she thought it was one child having like a split personality here. She wants to go to shul, wants to go. So then they told her, no, you got twins. So at least she was happy. That means it's not one person with a dual personality or schizophrenia, or religious schizophrenia, if that's even a word. I don't know. But anyway, but how's that any better? Yeah, how can you, in the womb here, you're telling me he's going out wanting to get to a shul and he's wanting to get to a, a, a place of a bodhisattva. I thought everybody has free choice. I thought everybody is equal. I thought everybody has the ability. Hashem gives you things, but not whether you're going to serve heaven or so. So the answer is, of course, they could have changed. But Hashem predisposed Yaakov to be a certain way, and he lived up to it. And he gave Aesop certain challenges that you with your abilities and your natural instincts. That's the word I was looking for, instincts, right? People are born with different instincts, right? Um, like the story of Moshe Rabbeinu, they put the, 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 the crown in the coals and they saw if he went to the crown, it means he's got an instinct to be a leader, be a king, right? Some people are so soft-spoken and interested in being a leader. So how your instincts and your, your, your drives. So Esau, he was predisposed, his instincts were wicked and evil and difficult. But that's one of the reasons why Asa, uh, Yitzchok was fooled, because he still had that good ability in him, right? He still was able to overcome it, but he seemed only to be able to overcome it when he was in the presence of his father, not in any uh, other time. And maybe that's why he wanted to give him the brochos, because he saw them. Anyway, so you see that doesn't necessarily cause a problem, because people are predisposed to do certain things, right? People do have certain challenges in life that they can choose to overcome, but... That's the challenge they have. So that's one way of understanding this Gemara, which would have fitted in all with what we learned in Oshiorim. And I was very happy. Didn't cause me too much of a bombshell to my religious understanding. And uh, everything was good. And I was literally about to go to bed at night. And I was listening to a Shia by Rabbi Cheskel Hartman. Literally, I was in bed, actually. And uh, he quoted from the Sefer Hasidim which is a sefer that goes through a lot of big ideas in, in, in Yiddishkeit. And the sefer Hasidim says that Hashem does create people wicked. He does make people wicked. He creates wicked people, create people without free will. And he bases it on a Gemara in Chagiga. So let's have a look at that. 
Gemara, and we'll see now what our new understanding of life is all about, or a new less understanding of life, anyway. So the Gemara Chagigo is Daf Yud Gimel Amud Base 13b, going over to 14a. This chapter of Chagiga is an enlightening chapter. It's very difficult to understand in a way, because this talks about Maasei Merkava, the secrets of creation and the secrets of uh, the world. Huh? Yeah, that's the chapter about Maasei Merkava and stuff. The story with Ache, this great rabbi, the student, the teacher of Rabbi Meir, who, who, who uh, went uh, off the wet rails and, and so on. So it's, it's, it's a fascinating chapter of... Uh, of, of uh, uh, of Gemara, fascinating stories and ideas that are very difficult to understand about, uh, 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 you know, the uh, spheres of heaven and, and, and the angels and so on. And in that Gemara, at the bottom of 13b says like this, a bit of background. We know the Torah was given on Hasina after 26 generations. We know that the Mishnah Pekah Yavah says 10 generations from Adam to Noach. Ten generations from Noah to Avram makes twenty altogether. And from Avram to the total was six. You got Yitzchak, Yaakov. Yaakov's son was Levi. Levi's son was Kahas. He had Amram and he had Moshe. So six. So we know that the total was given after 26 generations, which is a numerical value of God's name, yud ke Vavke, and so on. However, there is a part that we say regularly, that the Torah davat siva le'elef dor, we say regularly on a Shabbos. That the Torah was given le'elef dor. So the literal translating is for a thousand years. That means the Torah will only last for a thousand uh, generations, rather. But that's hard to understand because the Torah is like timeless. So the way they understand it, says the Gemara, is the Torah was supposed to be given after one thousand generations. It was supposed to be after a thousand generations, but God saw that we're getting a bit uh, carried away with life here. Eh? We've already had to bring one flood, right, after uh, ten generations, right? And then they built this tower of Babylon. Um, then they tried to throw Abraham into the fire. We, we're not going to last till a thousand generations. We need the Torah. We need our blueprint for life in order for the world to function. Otherwise, the world is going to fall to pieces. So the Gemara says, so what happened to these other 974 generations, right? Because if it was supposed to be a thousand generations and God gave the Torah after 26, thousand minus 26, 974, which means there were 974 generations that were not supposed to have the Torah that had the Torah, right? So you would have thought, oh, great. But that's not how those people saw it. So says the Gemara like this. What happened to these people? Says the Gemara, oh, so the Gemara is going through a whole story about angels and all sorts of things up there. And then it goes, Amar, that this is referred to the heads of the Rishoim Gehenim. Because he cut them down. Amar Rav Shimon Achasid, what does it mean God cut down all these people? Elu Teisha Meya is Veshisha Ve'arba Doros, these are the 974 generations. Shekot Meli Hibaraos, Kodem Shnevra Olam, which he said in the end did live before the creation of the world. Again, it's a fascinating idea that there was a world before the world and there was people before the world. But again, this peric is so difficult to understand. I'm not even going to bother to explain it. But I never really won't create it. Whatever that means, again, I'm not here to explain that. But here's a bit we want to know. He took all of these people from these 974 generations and he hung them and threw them into each generation. And these are the stubborn, obstinate people in every generation. I saw a Bashat here just before we delve into what this means that these people were supposed to live without Torah. So they very hate the fact that there's Torah when they should have been in a life without Torah. Now, huh, we got all these rules. So they hate it in that sense because they should have lived without any rules. So that's why 
these, uh, I saw somewhere, but they were careful to whom I'm speaking, where it says, you know, there's always people who think they don't need rabbis and know more than the rabbis and cause the rabbis all sorts of issues, right? We start with Doth and Vaviron with Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, and even till this generation uh, today, I'll say no more. So they say, those are these people. These are these people that should have lived before Torah. So they think of the rabbi, I don't need you, rabbi. I should have been without the rabbi. I know more than you. So that's why uh, we have all these people today. But anyway, uh, I'm being recorded here, so I, I better be careful what I say. Anyway, I've already said it, yes. <laughs> right, you've all been warned, and uh, so on. I'm on to you, and uh, yes. So, this is fascinating, says Rashi. Now, what did he do? He took these people, he took these people, and he threw them, these other Rishayim, in every generation. So, says the Sefer Hasidim, that's what this Gemara means. That God took Rishayim, evil, wicked people, and put these people in every single generation. So what that means is that Hashem is predestined wicked people to be in every single generation, says the Sefer Hasidim. That's how he proves from this Gemara. So according to him, there are people who have no free choice. There are people who do not have the ability to change or do good. They are simply wicked. And you think... Maybe you think of through history, right? We can think of some people that may be these people, right? Hitler, perhaps, right? These uh, such wicked, evil people. But again, it brings into big questions. So are these people judged? I mean, you know, if, I, if they are wicked and Hashem's putting them in with no free choice, I mean, surely the idea of these wicked people not being held accountable uh, is a frightening, scary uh, uh, thought. But I'm sure that can't be the truth. Uh, I mean, the Gemara itself talks about people like uh, Nebuchadnezzar, who was a very wicked, evil man. You would have thought he was one of these people, talks about him being judged in Gehenna. And in fact, the next interpretation of the Gemara is Hashem didn't put them in every generation, but just number Gehenna. He threw them straight into Gehenna, uh, which Tosfus has a big problem. Tosfus says, how can you throw them into Gehenna? What did they do wrong? How can you throw them into Gehenna when they didn't do anything wrong? But I suppose maybe we can see from there that what the Gemara is saying is even though these people are wicked and they have no choice, they still get punished for what they do. How, what, where, and who? As I say, I'm leaving you with more questions, perhaps, uh, than answers. But let's try and understand and rationalize a little bit of this. Because I did a lot of thinking about this, because this is really a bombshell to how we all think that it seems to be that there are people that are wicked and have no choice, Right? That you think to yourself, maybe we could be more done the caps of chus to people, right? When we see people doing things that are wrong, and they say, well, oh, it's not their fault. Maybe they're part of these people, uh, you know, 974 generations. That's a lot of people, right? <laughs> and they're all being squashed into now. So there's a lot of people in each generation. But then I thought to myself like this. Maybe it's not so conceptually difficult to understand. Maybe it's not so conceptually difficult. Why? Because if you look... I think, and I wasn't really thinking, I was only thinking about this late this afternoon, so I haven't fully processed. Sometimes when you give a share, you have more clarity. But I think there was a Rashi at the beginning, or there was a Medrash somewhere, which says that Hashem saw that there was only going to be a few amount of tzaddikim, and he threw them into every generation. There is a Medrash like that. I think it's brought down in Rashi at the beginning of the Torah, uh, where it says he threw the light away, he hid the light from the first few days of creation. The first four days, there was no sun. Um, and then he, he threw the tzaddikim. I'm sure there is such a, certainly a majest like that. Um, uh, I'm sure there is a majors like that, that uh, he saw that there was only a few tzaddikim. It was only going to be a small amount of tzaddikim. So he thought, rather than all living at once, I'm going to throw them to every generation. So I was thinking about that. So you got to level up the playing field. If you're going to have Sadiqim in every generation, surely you're going to have to have Rishayim in every generation too. Because otherwise, there's no real challenge. Because you could end up with a situation where everybody controls themselves and becomes good and is a great Sadiq and sees the light, sees Hashem. 
In which case, there's no real challenge. That's what we know. We don't, if you do an Avera, you don't get uh, killed straight away. You don't have a fire. What's it, the analogy? You don't get hit, struck by lightning, right? Why? Because then there's no challenge, right? If as soon as you 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 uh, do something wrong, you get hit by lightning, you're not going to do it, right? You touch the electrified fence once and you get electrocuted, you're not going to touch it again because, you know, it's electrified. So if that would happen, there's no contest. The whole point of this world, Olam is Nelam, it's hidden. We have a challenge here. So if it was so obvious and clear of what the right path is, then we would have no reward for it. It would be no challenge. It would be easy. So maybe because of that, Hashem says, well, in order to level up the playing field, I'm going to have to have planters, right? What is it when you, when you go to an auction, right? Uh, what's the word? Uh, it's, huh? Shil. Shil. Is that what they call them? They, they, they plant people to raise up the uh, bidding level, right? Uh -huh. Think it's illegal. I'm sure it's illegal, right? And, uh, right. So they have people to artificially raise up the uh, price of things. So maybe that's the same idea here. Hashem has planted people, both wicked, like we saw here in this Gemara, wicked people into the world. And he also has, of course, some tzaddikim, great tzaddikim. So you have a little bit of a balance in order that there should constantly remain a battle and a challenge. There's always this, uh, what do they call it? Light and darkness. The battle between light and darkness. Which one is going to win? The light overpowers the darkness or the darkness shuts out the light, right? That's the idea. If you had too much light, right, you see everything. Too much darkness, you see nothing. So maybe it's not so conceptually difficult to understand that these people are not real people. Yes, they're real people. They breathe. They do everything that we do, of course. But in that sense, they're not real people. In that sense, they are not part of the struggle of life. They are not part of God's plan to give them reward, again, when it comes to evil and wicked and punishments, again, that's a, a difficult concept to try and get your head around with certainly some wicked people that we've seen uh, even in recent history. But perhaps it's not such a difficult concept because maybe it's talking about giving you the opportunity to see, oh, yes, I see all these wicked people. Oh, yes, I see all these people uh, doing the, oh, yes, they look great. They look having a great lifestyle. Oh, they're wicked. They're doing great. Or, oh, wait, no, I see these great tzaddikim here. Oh, yes, look, oh, wonderful, holy, special people. You've got to have, like, uh, you know, the balance. So I wonder, again, my own thinking, I wonder if that's something that's going on uh, with the same Hasidim. But again, it's, it's a real uh, interesting concept to try and, uh, understand and it raises a lot of questions but coming to Rosh Hashanah hopefully none of the people here on Zoom or none of the people sitting here or any of those people who have been uh, stuck here from those previous generations again whatever that means um, he had two ideas whether it was before the world or, or during the world or whatever but we certainly do have the ability to decide what we are going to be are we going to see the light we say, the David Hashem Ori. Hashem is my light. The Gemara says, Ori zu Rosh Hashanah. It refers to Rosh Hashanah, which is why one of the reasons we say Psalm 27 in Elul. And Yishi, salvation is, is, is Yom Kippur. That's easy to understand. You get forgiven for my sins. So he's, you know, he rescues me, stops me from falling into the pit. So that's easy to understand. But why is Rosh Hashanah called my light? What's the idea? Rosh Hashanah, Hashem is my light. And that's what we're saying here. The idea of Rosh Hashanah, is to internalize to ourselves. Those of you who have been here in previous years, and there are a couple on Zoom uh, that have been to my sermons on Rosh Hashanah, and they're usually all the same, although I didn't give a sermon last year Rosh Hashanah, so it's been two years, so people will have forgotten it by then. But it uh, doesn't matter if they remember it, because we've got to go over it again and again. But the theme of my Rosh Hashanah sermons always is, this is real. Rosh Hashanah is real. The chauffeur, Hashem, books of life and death. It's real. It's not a uh, conceptual idea. It's not a game. It's not a, a Kabbalistic a notion idea. It's real. And we have to, the whole working of Musaf and the Shofar and the whole idea of what we're trying to achieve in Rosh Hashanah is to b really believe, truly believe, not just in your head, Oh, yes, I believe. Lip service, as people say, right? Yeah, of course. Would you believe? Yes, of course, I believe. Life and death? Yes, of course. God, yes, of course. But do you truly internalize 
that every single thing that happens, that happens to me, is from the power of Hashem, from the might of Hashem, and all the skills that I have amassed, and all the networking opportunities that have been presented to me, are all orchestrated from Hashem. And of course, with the big things, it's easy to see. Oh, oh, ah, haven't seen you for 25 years. Oh, yes, you have a great deal for me. Great. Everyone can see that's easy. We know that's from Hashem. But even little things. That's the challenge of Rosh Hashanah, to realize that Hashem is the one who is truly guiding and lighting my life, leading my life. And then when you see that and you internalize that, that's like the light. It opens, the light comes on, and that illuminates all the darkness. And you see all the things that you thought were dark and difficult and so on. Really, it's all part of Hashem's plan. Doesn't mean we understand it. It's not about understanding, right? It's not about uh, understanding uh, of, of, of so on. In the sense that uh, you don't understand how these rockets are ending up on the moon or they look like planes nowadays that Richard Branson was driving. Uh, right? You don't understand. Well, maybe some people here, I don't know what skills people have. But in general, right? You don't understand how these aircrafts are getting to space. But you see it. So it's real. You don't understand it. How on earth is this guy sitting in the plane? Oh, I'm in space. Hello. And then he's back down again. Or that the rocket I was watching uh, fell um, 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 thousands of miles and landed pinpoint on, 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 on the spot, you know, coming down at uh, one point thousands of miles an hour. And, oh, hello. You know, so how, how does that work? You don't understand it, but you see it. It's there. So the same is with life. You don't have to understand it. You just have to know that it's real. You just have to know that it's true. You have to know that it is just. So I said I would try and speak less than 45 minutes. So we got to uh, almost 45 minutes. So to be true to my word, I said on Shabbos, 30 minutes-ish was my uh, wording. And I always, in the same way as my wedding invitation, I had the time of the chuppah and I put afterwards a prox. And when I did the calendar, though, they always try and take it out. But I always like to put where it says chauffeur. I always put a prox, right? They always try and take it out. I say, Rabbi, just keep it. I said, no, a prox. So people know it's a prox. So nobody can complain. Excuse me, you said chauffeur, 10, 15. It's now 12 o'clock. I'll say, well, we had an hour mass break, so therefore that's why we're late. You know, I always like to put a prox because, you know, first of all, with the chuppah, when is the chuppah, right? When it says chuppah three o'clock, this is a question people find that's very difficult to answer. You see an invitation, chuppah three o'clock, let's say, what is the chuppah? Is it when they're both standing there together, having done the 45 minute procession? Is it when you go to sign the ketubah? Is it when you do the bedecking? So everyone has a different answer to that anyway, right? The person writing the invitation thinks, yes, when we start writing the ketubah, we do the bedecking. The people coming, the yakis are like, no, it's when you start making the first brachas already, after the seven times walking around, that's the chuppah. So here it's 30 minutes-ish, uh, and I, uh, I hope, we, as I say, maybe we had more questions than answers tonight, but I hope at least it's something to think about, uh, especially when coming to Rosh Hashanah and, and, and thinking about how real everything is how real Hashem is, how, how, how the most important part of, and that's why, to be very brief, we'll talk about this more in another share, maybe we'll go through some of the ideas, that's why I believe Rosh Hashanah is before Yom Kippur. The question is, well, surely we should be forgiven for our sins before we start begging for what we want, right? Surely that's the way you do it. But I think to myself, there's many answers, but to be very brief, no, because first you have to realize the truth. Only, oh, yes, once you realize, you're just, whoops, now look at me. I don't quite live up to my new reality that I've realized, and then you get forgiven for your sins. So again, I've teased you a little bit uh, for, for next week and, and, and so on. So I'm going to unmute everybody. Let me stop the recording so people don't...